When we actually started looking for a new city hall facility, we explored several different options. We actually looked at the Common Pleas Courthouse by itself as a possible option initially several years ago, and it was too small and wasn't going to accommodate all of our people and all of our needs. Well, what if, what if we took the courthouse and the library and we connected them? I think to have allowed just an old worn out building to be torn down would have just cut the heart <laughs> out of what makes a city with so much history and variety uh, to just become like any other city. And it, it's not always practical to keep old buildings. Uh, it's not always feasible, but when you can, it means a lot. We need to not just save it from the wrecking ball. We need to not just, you know, fix the leaks. We need to do something that, you know, will really be a, a standout project that will make the community proud, you know, for 50 years, you know, or 100 years. We can look back on this project and say, people of Cape Girardeau did the right thing and they did it really well. The Common Police Courthouse, you know, was built in 1850 to 54. It's probably the most iconic building in Cape Girardeau because it overlooks the river. And uh, years ago, people coming up and down the river, that was the first thing they saw. And to have a massive building up on top of a hill like that had to be majestic. And it's, uh, it's served its purpose well over the years. Carnegie Library, I think, was actually one of the last Carnegie Libraries built back in 1920, I think. And, uh, uh, having them here together was, you know, there was some synergy there and it was like the center of town. The courthouse has been the central location of just an enormous number of important events and, and it continues to serve uh, in that capacity in the lives of people today. And, you know, the court has, has moved out of there, you know, so we're not seeing, you know, court cases. When politicians come to stump for votes, it, you know, they don't do it on the courthouse lawn anymore, but, you know, the community still gathers, it tunes at twilight. And I think that important day-to-day -day business of people's lives um, has been taking place in that arena um, continuously from the 1850s uh, even, even through today and given new life with the location of the, the city hall. So, so I think the courthouse it, it just has that, that center um, you know, importance. The Carnegie Library, I think, has its own distinctive um, history that also resonates deeply with, with the history of Cape Girardeau and the, the lives of, of its people. It's one of the last Carnegie Libraries to be constructed, which I think is also interesting in that libraries were something that Andrew Carnegie was interested in. Um, and when he died, the Carnegie Foundation stopped doing libraries. So Cape Girardeau had initiated the process and then kind of put it on the back burner during World War One. You know, by the time they got back to it, Carnegie was dead. They were no longer funding libraries. But because we had already started the process, they agreed to participate and to fund this. Um, it's the last public library that I could find um, that, that, was, that was funded. I found a number of libraries that were built um, afterwards, they came a little bit later, but they were all on university campuses. And so I'm not saying it's the last one, but it's the last one I could find. And, and so that's kind of significant um, uh, for us as well. So we have those long standing roots into the history of the community and this new project um, and the new construction that ties those two historic buildings together enables them to, to, to have new life and to continue to be um, the center of, um, you know, of the community. And, and so I, I think it's a pretty exciting project. So we had the two existing buildings that we were working with, the Common Pleas Courthouse originally built in the 1850s and then the Carnegie Library built in the 1920s. Different styles of architecture, different materials, both brick but different colors and whatnot. And when we decided to marry the two buildings together, we really wanted to be cognizant of the Secretary of Interior Standards for Historic Preservation, which clearly states that you shouldn't try to replicate what's already there. You should really try to make it look different. And so we wanted to utilize the same material brick, but it was very important and very deliberate that we made it a different color. So you don't want to try and outdo 
the glory of the existing historic buildings, you wanna to try to make it compatible. So it was a very deliberate and intentional um, thing that we did with the, with the lighter colored brick. So the modern styling of it is what marks it as a 21st century building, right? You're, you're not confused. You're like, oh, 19, 20, 21, I get it, right? It is, it, it's easy to see that, but it's compatible when you look at the colors, when you look at the rhythm of the openings and the colors kind of working together, when you see the way in which the spaces do adjoin and, and the touch between the new building and the courthouse is so incredibly light. I mean, it just kisses it, and then it has that glass enclosed atrium space, so you can see it, you can move from one to the other easily, but, um, but it's very gentle, it's, it treats it so gently. So from a design perspective, it's different, so you're not confused, but it's compatible, so it, it harmonizes. So it was really interesting when we started the renovation of this building in particular and we started taking the walls apart and uncovering the past and some of those unique items includes the signature of Fred Steck on the door upstairs outside finance department and so we, we had a little bit of research conducted and determined that he was a carpenter in the late 1800s in our area, lived here in Cape and uh, we believe that he was involved in the construction of the 1888 addition to the courthouse. Well, that was pretty cool, and so we decided that that was something that we needed to highlight and keep um, an exhibit for all to see. And then also the balustrades outside of the public information office were originally from the courtroom upstairs, but we also thought it important to incorporate some of the history into the, the new facility, if you will. Also redoing some of the more iconic aspects of the building, the cupola, we refurbished that. That is very well known, obviously, throughout Cape, and so it was important to make sure that we took care of that and, and refurbished that as well. The ceiling upstairs, uh, second floor of the Common Police Courthouse, the plaster ceiling up there is very um, remarkable, and it was covered up previously when the county was operating here and in the courtroom there was a dropped ceiling, and so we were very happy to see that when we removed that dropped ceiling that that plaster ceiling was intact. And so we did refurbish that and kept some of the important architectural features there. While we were digging for the this building, the City Hall building, we uncovered a lot of different things when we replaced the steps coming up to the courthouse and even down in the basement, we found a few things, but we found a lot of artifacts. No gold. <laughs> Way down in the basement of the uh, Common Police Courthouse was an area that originally had a tunnel. Now, the door was still there, but at some point in history, and I think it was 1900, when they poured the steps out front, and at that point in time, that tunnel had to be filled in in order to build the steps. But at one time, there was a tunnel that ran down to the river, I understand. I can't confirm that, but that's the folklore. When I was learning about Cape's history and this property in particular, there were always talks about a, a tunnel, that there was a tunnel somewhere on the property. And, and I don't know that there's ever been one found, but there's always rumors that there was a tunnel from the basement that led out and whatnot. But one of the nods that we made to that rumor was we actually put in a tunnel from our parking garage to the new portion of City Hall. So it's a little bit of an homage to that that history or that myth or whatever you want to call it. And it's a phenomenal way for our staff to get in here securely and safe place to go in times of bad weather as well. So I think that's a really cool part of the project too. There's a lot of parts and pieces to this project that are very special. Part of our job was to preserve history as well as create a modern space for the city to work out of. And so it was a great challenge. Uh, the real challenge was the fact that the floor elevation of the Common Police Courthouse and the Carnegie Library was six foot differential. So we had to tie everything in with different levels of stairs. And even though you got three stories here, the elevator has five stops. 
So <laughs> made it a challenge. In the Carnegie Library, we had to demo an edition that was put in in the late 50s, I believe. And our sincere hope was to uncover all the original stonework that was in the Carnegie Library. And as luck would have it, probably 95 plus percent was still there. And the pieces that we had to remake were easy to make. And uh, what you see now is what was originally designed into the original building. So it's just all around exciting for me. And I've made the comment that I believe that it is arguably the uh, best project in our company history, Pencil Construction's history. So the budget was $12 million, and a good portion of that came from a capital improvement sales tax that our voters approved in 2019. So we had a $6 million from that taxing source, and then we had $6 million from the casino fund. We had a couple associated projects with the building itself, and that was Spanish Street. We were able to, to redo Spanish Street and, and Lorimer Street, where we had some sewer work. So um, some additional street construction projects that added to um, just enhance what we did here with the facility. The Court of Common Pleas has very interesting history, you know, during the Civil War when the Union Army um, began accepting African-American recruits. They signed up there at the courthouse and, you know, that's part of what led to the renaming of the courthouse grounds as Ivers Square in honor of James Ivers and his widow Harriet. James was an enslaved person in uh, Cape Girardeau and he literally would have walked up those stairs and into that building and volunteered to serve the Union Army. He did not return, he died of disease, but nonetheless he made the ultimate sacrifice. And it's kind of a stand-in for you know, the hundreds of uh, enslaved men who um, volunteered there at the, um, at the courthouse. To connect the, the reason for the statue, we have to go to the reason that we renamed uh, Courthouse Park Ivers Square. If you know anything about Missouri, Missouri was a slave state, and so there were many people enslaved in Missouri and in Cape Girardeau. And there's no acknowledgement of that, no marker that includes their contribution to what makes Cape Girardeau Cape Girardeau. So the Ivers family came to my mind James Ivers was enslaved in this immediate neighborhood. His wife was also enslaved in this immediate neighborhood. In the middle of the war, the African-American men were allowed to enlist. Jim was one of the first men on the first day to enlist. And his widow stayed in this area in freedom, continued to work, raise her family, and eventually was able to save enough money to buy property. One of the first women that I can find of African descent who owned property in this town. Everywhere you look, there is some African American history, but there's not anything to talk about it or to illustrate it or to give tribute to it. Knowing the intricate story of the Ivers family and how they were without doubt walking through this property day in and day out. Uh, this is where they live their lives. And so to be able to, to give proof to that just made that the logical choice. But the fact that the courthouse park had no name, and it was just you know a generalized locale and referred to only as courthouse park for almost 200 years, it just seemed like it was a placeholder waiting for a story to happen. And so it was a good time in our nation and in our community's maturation, I think, to embrace a larger story than the typical one told. So it's not actually a statue of James Ivers, right? It's a U.S. Color Troop memorial statue, you know, so it's a kind of a representative individual. And the statue then honors both the U.S. Color Troops who served in the Civil War, but in particular, and I forget the exact number, but several hundred, 200, 250 enslaved um, African-American males um, volunteered to join the Union Army in that courthouse, you know, in 1863. And so it's to honor them and their service. 
Well, the 1911 statue was envisioned many years before it came possible, and it was the contributions of women who wanted the story to be remembered. By 1911, the war had been over for several decades. The veterans were beginning to pass away, and yet the women wanted to memorialize um, their fathers, their sons, their brothers who, who fought for the war. It was a collective effort of women who had soldiers from both sides of the conflict, Confederate and Union, and it was dedicated initially to all who fought for the Civil War. This was, I think, a peace offering kind of a thing uh, to commemorate the war and the sacrifice, but then to move forward. This is the history of Cape Girardeau at its finest. I mean, why would you want to destroy history? You know, right here is where Cape Girardeau started, basically. And why not make your city management operate right where this city started? When you look back at the things that have happened at that Common Police Courthouse, uh, you know, Ulysses Grant used it as his headquarters in the Civil War. The university burned in 1811 and they had classes down here. When you look at all the things that have happened over the years and the history that's there and the people that have, that have uh, you know, been through that courthouse for various things, uh, you know, the history is important to maintain. I've been a citizen of Cape Girardeau for uh, 40 years now, and when I think of Cape, I think of this hillside. So I think it's important that we keep this place and show the generational progress, ingenuity, and foresight of, of each layer of our city's history. I think it's important that Cape Girardeau understood its heart in its downtown and has invested in it and rehabilitated it, and we're good to go. Keep that heart beating. <laughs>